Thanks very much. It's uh, really an honor and a privilege for me to be here. I haven't been uh, tracking uh, since I got out. I was uh, went into industry. Luckily, I was able to get into an organization that had uh, several uh, work and had been for several years with the military. And with my background, that's really what I was hired for. So it wasn't also the uh, people that I, I knew. And as you have heard and read about, maybe I could open some doors for some people. I'm not sure I did that too successfully. But I sure, certainly enjoyed being close to the military, having spent all those number of years. What I want to do here today is to uh, try to seize upon a follow-up. It's hard to follow up, uh, so I admire, that's for sure. But uh, uh, I'll give you some lessons and talk about my experiences uh, in Vietnam at the end of the, uh, uh, my speech here. But talk about leadership, qualities that are necessary, and some of the values that are necessary for you to successfully make it a career or even successfully make the first three to five or four years or 10 or whatever it is to succeed uh, in the military. Um, as I begin, I'm reminded of uh, Sir Winston Churchill's advice on speech making. He was known to say, be brief, be bright, and be gone. I'm not sure about the first two, but I certainly will be gone. Uh, the profession of arms is a noble profession the great task of each professional officer is to preserve our institutions through our teaching and example and to pass on to those who follow our dedication to the profession of arms. The main thing to say about the American officer is that he or she is different. The difference between an officer of our armed forces and the other good citizens engaged in other professions and vocations is one of obligation, responsibility, commitment, and expectation. Then too, as with other professions, special qu skills, qualities, and understandings are required. Beyond their initial commitment and the special framework within, within which they agree to serve, you and I, American officers are also unique in a number of other important ways. We stem from no single source, selection, or school. We come from no one region no single social or economic element, no particular race or religion, and we hold no single point of view. In yet another sense, American officers are different. We can be singled out. We can be identified as a separate segment because we belong to a unique community, a unique profession, the military fraternity, which shares an unlimited commitment to what General Sir John Hackett, the, who was the Commander-in-Chief of the British Army of the Rhine many years ago, referred to as an unlimited liability contract. We have a special closeness designed not to remove us from the society we serve, but rather to give us corporate strength. Officers, servicemen and women, units, families, entire communities, to withstand adversity and to act with responsible strength and purpose in time of emergency. In terms of professional responsibility, American officers are quite unique. We are entrusted with human lives, and we dispose of enormous military power. Thus, there is the potential on one hand to abuse power, and on the other hand to use power sensitively, responsibly, wisely, and for the good of the nation and its people. In sum, if you come into the armed forces as an officer, you must be representative of the best of our society and reflective of its finest values and aspirations. Can you live up to all of that? Can anyone? I don't know, but I know we must try. If we do, we will succeed in the finest sense of that word. Moreover, in a much smaller and self-centered sense, you'll be able to avoid the kind of efficiency reports which an Army general long ago gave to some of his subordinates. You might be interested in hearing a couple of them so that if you get a report someday that shocks you, you will be able to put it in perspective. These are a few comments from Brigadier General Lewis Cass during the period of, of the War of 1812, writing from a small town in Tennessee and reporting on the officers of the 27th Infantry. He said, quote, these are all the observations I deem it necessary to make. Lieutenant Carner, a good officer but drinks hard and disgraces himself in the service. 
that's getting right to it, isn't it? Lieutenant Elder, an ignorant, unoffending Irishman. Lieutenants Gear, Clifford, and Crawford, all Irish, promoted from the ranks, low, vulgar men without any one qualification to recommend them. And lastly, Ensign Bean, the very dregs of the earth, unfit for anything under heaven, God only knows how the poor thing got an appointment. <laughs> By the way, that's no insult to the Irish intended. I'm, I'm half Irish myself. American officers, indeed all soldiers, have unique obligations. And derived from these, we also have unique needs for understanding and support. We are obliged to obey orders. We must go places and do things which are hard and dangerous, and do these without debating, questioning, or voting. We are obliged to face up to separation and privation. The members of the group are required to give up some of their rights, part of their freedom, in order that freedom and the rights of the entire nation and its citizens might be protected. It is because members of the military give so much in the common interest that they have traditionally been supported by the nation. On the other side, we see increasing efforts to provide lasting care for our service members. And by the way, that's getting better, it seems to be, at least from the VA standpoint. By increasing the amount and quality of care, we are all rewarded. I'm reminded by what the late General George C. Marshall had to say about the soldier. Quote, the soldier is a man. He expects to be treated as an adult, not as a schoolboy. He has his rights. They must be made known to him and thereafter respected. He has ambition. It must be stirred. He has a belief in fair play. It must be honored. He has need for comradeship. It must be supplied. He has imagination. It must be stimulated. He has a sense of personal dignity. It must be sustained. He has pride. It can be satisfied and made the bedrock of character once he is assured that he is playing a useful and respective role. To give a man this is the acme of inspired leadership. He becomes loyal because loyalty has been given to him. That advice by General Marshall is timeless in its value. Now, while I have pointed out some differences between our profession and others, there are obviously many similarities. Perhaps the most important is leadership. Leadership is one common thread through all organizations, whether it be business, church, or military organizations. In the Army, as well as presumably in the other services as well, we have for years wrestled with leadership on a rather esoteric basis. Many of us have written treatises on the subject, and we've argued over the issue of whether leadership is an organizational process or a personal characteristic, or whether it is both, whether it is innate or can be developed. While there are many ways to define leadership, I prefer the simple one that leadership is the capacity or ability to lead. And I agree that the cornerstone of leadership is character, as stated by a retired Army Colonel Len Morella, who happens to be the founder and director of the Center for Leadership and Ethics. A good definition for character is defined by the West Point leadership courses as, quote, those moral qualities that constitute the nature of a person and shape his or her decisions and actions. A few years ago, I read a description by David Marlowe, a student and author of, the, of World War II offensive operations, in which he captured what I believe to be the essence of leadership. I quote, what enabled them to attack and attack and attack week after week in mud, rain, dust, and until the enemy was smashed? It seemed to me that the drive was more a positive one than a negative one. It was love more than hate. Love manifested by first, regard for their comrades who shared the same dangers. Second, respect for their platoon leader or company commander who led them wisely and backed them with everything at his command. Third, concern for their reputation with their commander and leaders. And fourth, an urge to contribute to the task and success of their group and unit. He went on to say, in the ultimate payoff, when the troops have to take and hold ground, the qualities of good leadership significant for success are first, devotion to one's task and to one's men, second, a respectful sharing of knowledge as to objectives and means, and third, a reasonable degree of mastery of technique and material. The late five-star General Omar Bradley echoed this belief when he said, quote, 
A man is not a leader until his appointment is confirmed by his men, unquote. General Bradley knew that military commanders are responsible for training, morale, and esprit de corps. He understood there is a certain chemistry at work in great units, and that there is an interaction between a good unit, its soldiers, and its commander. He also knew that chemistry doesn't come about by accident, that it involves sweat, work, time, shared experiences, shared victories, and sometimes shared defeats. Now I want to turn to certain aspects of leadership with the emphasis on values. In the mid-80s, before your time, I had that great honor to command the 1st Cav Division, the first team as it calls itself. During my first year, we had spent a great deal of time and effort developing our first team command system. This system provided a process to clarify the division's purposes and values, decide the future direction for the division, formalize a process by which performance can be linked from individual through battalion, brigade, and division to accomplish the division's mission and identify clear responsibility for actions at all levels within the division. The whole process started with clarifying the organizational values. As it happened, the Secretary of the Army and the Chief of Staff of the Army jointly announced that the theme for the coming year would be values. They, the values, then became the focal point of the process. First, what are values? Values are desirable qualities held by individuals and institutions that are worthy of high esteem and that serve as moral, ethical, and professional guideposts for action. Values are key ingredients of character, the sum and substance of our traits and attributes, and character is, is what enables us to withstand the rigors of combat or surmount other challenges. The values that the Army selected in that year were the four C's, as we call them, competence, courage, candor, and commitment. I know that the current Army values of loyalty, duty, respect, selfless service, honor, integrity, and personal courage are quite similar to the older ones, as they should be. Let me discuss briefly the four C's, competence is the prime battlefield requirement and is central to all aspects of the soldier's environment. Competence is the basis for skill and confidence in oneself and in others, and is the hallmark of effective leaders. This includes those who are in a position or aspiring to become leaders. Although society and institutions expose us to education and training, each individual is personally responsible for applying that exposure to oneself this competency must be visible at each individual's operating level and within the normal day-to-day -day operations as they contribute to the mission accomplishment. Competence extends through other values, providing confidence which builds moral courage. Physical courage on the battlefield is given, is a given. The essential, however, is moral courage. Taking risks, even though the choice not to do so, is open. That is why leaders setting the example are so important. Commanders must foster a supportive command climate that permits soldiers to do tough things. Within the framework of the chain of command climate, moral courage exists in the form of convictions, making tough decisions, visualizing the need for action, and then taking it, saying the unpleasant words when necessary. Moral courage is evident when the spoken word and the written word are identical and candid. Candor springs from courage and means openness plus honesty plus accuracy plus simplicity. Candor must be the primary factor governing communications. Candor operates to ensure the best positive transfer of meaning and intent. Candor serves to develop trust, confidence, and commitment. Commitment focuses on soldiers rather than things. Throughout, com throughout commitment is caring, which is the catalyst for transforming commitment from words into actions. It is the value that welds people into co cohesive units. Commitment, like courage, is evident in a participatory, honest climate or open communication. This process links together all parts of the fighting force. We added two other values, teamwork and discipline. Teamwork implies that we are not by ourselves, that we must work and pull together as one in order to accomplish the mission even if that means sacrificing the short-term individual gain for long-term collective success. It is selflessness.
Discipline is the soul of any military unit. Without it, we are a rabble. With it, we have the opportunity to realize our potential. Finally, I add one more, and that is integrity. It caps all the others and is the one which an individual has to protect at all costs. It is his or hers to have, and only he or she can lose it. If discipline is the soul of the unit, then integrity must be the heart of any soldier. It's hard to teach values. As a former Army Chief of Staff said some years ago, quote, unlike soldierly skills, values are more caught than taught. They are caught by young soldiers from their leaders and their peers, from the ethical climate that exists in their units. They are caught by us as we attend various military schools. They are caught by children and families where moral values are lived day in and day out. In the first CAV, the philosophy of leadership was centered on the concept that leadership is a process, that the process is the synergistic effect of all the components outlined in leadership programs. And the, if the process is working, then our leadership is on a firm basis. One of the key elements of this process is empowering people or power down as it may be known. A philosophy of giving leaders the responsibility inherent with their positions and the freedom to exercise that responsibility. The key is the leader's knowledge of his or her subordinate skills and ability and this one, the soldier's willingness to take responsibility for their own performance and the leader's trust of them and his or her own judgment so that he or she will have the courage to decentralize. We want to raise standards while simultaneously decentralizing. Embedded in this theory is the requirement of the leader to accept the responsibility given him or her. The concept has several subsets. Leaders, not committees, must coach and teach their subordinates. The reward system for leaders must be geared to implementing the power down concept that is rewarding the whole, even if it means willing to go for the long-term payoff versus the immediate on-my-watch reward. This philosophy seems almost exactly like the definition from the DOD Dictionary of Mission Command, executing mission-type orders. So values are extremely important for all of us. They become the framework for the lifelong professional and personal development of our soldiers, leaders, and families. As the Secretary of the Army and the Army Chief of Staff said in their announcement, quote, our profession involves matters of life and death and matters of public trust for the responsible care of human as well as material resources provided to us in times of danger. It is the ethical elements of soldierly conduct and the leadership which bond soldiers and units together, enabling them to survive the rigors of combat. In peacetime as, as in times of danger, rock-solid ethical underpinnings help us resist the pressures to compromise integrity, to cheat, to shade the truth, or debase patriotism for material gain. In sum, values are critical to our well-being as an individual, a family, a unit, and our armed forces. We need to constantly review those values we hold dear and where we can strengthen them so that we can contribute to our own well-being, our livelihood, and our country. I'm going to now take a advantage of the where I'm at and talk a little bit about one of these aspects, and that is the teamwork. Uh, sometimes overlooked, although we all have been part of teams, we understand that you're pulling together for a common good, trying to reach your aims and goals set aside by by you as as the team and your managers and coaches and the like. I understand that, but let let me describe it in a little bit in, during the time of battle. Um, on the 1st of March, 1970, I was commanding the 2nd Battalion, 8th Cav, part of the 1st Cav Division, and I was uh, approximately 80, uh, 65 miles northwest of Tain Inn, which is a little bit uh, north uh, east of Saigon, about five miles from the Cambodian border on fire support base Illingworth. We had established that on the 17th of March, the fire base uh, was, um, was the eighth fire base that I had constructed with my battalion in the past eight weeks. The tactics that were implied and were ordered uh, by the assistant division commander 
who was a former CAF person and the current commander, General Roberts, the commanding general, was to take battalions like mine and hopscotch them around the area where we noticed the traffic of North Vietnamese and the Viet Cong. And the idea was to intercept them, disrupt them, make them, make them known where we were, but also that we were going to be there probably three days, four days, five days, and then fly away and, and uh, establish another fire base. So he got me and the battalion I had to start that process, leaning back on the wisdom that he brought, that both of them brought from previous tours there over there, thought it would probably work rather than trying to go into what had been there for the last few years, stationary fire bases, which all that did was create havoc. Uh, it wasn't any surprise where you were, you know, from the enemy standpoint, it was easy to try to pick off. So as we approach the end of March, uh, I was getting a little bit concerned because I knew we had overstayed our normal five, six, seven days. As a matter of fact, it was getting closer toward 10 days, 12 days and whatnot. So I pleaded uh, with uh, my boss, brigade commander, and then henceforward he, he flipped it up to the uh, assistant division commander that, uh, you know, I was being left out to dry here. There wasn't any doubt about where the enemy was. We had seen them. They had seen us. We had both observed one another. They were about uh, just about 350 to 400 yards away in a wood line. God knows how many they had. We kept probing out there, but uh, we knew it was a, a number that greatly exceeded those that we had on our fire, fire support base, which was probably just shy of 200 people. I had a, a company uh, manning the berm, and I put in uh, my best unit, which turns out to be the recon platoon of Echo Company. The other companies, Charlie Company, uh, that was the one, uh, had just been uh, rescued, if you will, from a horrendous attack that they'd run into an ambush about five days before, so they were in pretty bad shape. We got some replacements, about 30 of those replacements uh, ended up, uh, came in about the 30th, uh, 29th and 30th of March. Um, added to that, there was another battalion that was, uh, came and located about just south of me, about five miles. And uh, they were in a similar situation. So I knew we were you know, stacking the deck on the Viet Cong and the North, Vies North Vietnamese Army. But, uh, you know, there we stood. So having said my piece and having basically said go back and command your battalion on the fire base and protect everybody, uh, I wasn't getting any relief at all. Besides all that, trying to put out and uh, construct another berm, if you will, and get individual uh, culverts and PSP, the, that the pure steel planking that we used over there, some wire, if you will, uh, was really shaky. Uh, they did come in with some, but lo and behold, in came two eight-inch uh, howitzers. That's the last thing I needed. Uh, I had uh, three uh, 105s, uh, excuse me, I had six 105s, I had three 155s, uh, that was plenty of uh, self-protection there. And I was in range of f several other fire support bases where other artillery units could, have, could be. And as a matter of fact, as part of that teamwork, uh, a demonstration was conducted by the division artillery commander who was no fan of mine and vice versa. He and I had knocked heads uh, together on the employment of some of his artillery at other fire bases. But he was, he was pretty well headstrong, but he was also a pretty brilliant guy. At any rate, he said, you know, we need practice in doing the things that artillery and infantry should do to work together, and that is that fire coordination and communication throughout. So about two days before the 1st of April, we put on a day, day. I wasn't there, but my liaison officer, a captain uh, was there and uh, came back and reported to me that they got a lot of things straightened out for it. Thank God for that. Two days later on the first, uh, let me backtrack just a second, on the 29th of March, the other fire support base uh, with the other battalion got hit pretty tough. And so again, another indication that I was about ready to suffer the same thing. That's, therein lies my hope, let's get out of here while we can. Didn't happen on the 1st of April. Uh, about two in the morning, uh, 
all hell broke loose. Uh, we took in about 300 or 350 rounds from the enemy, both mortar, artillery, uh, RPG rounds. They attacked what we thought would be uh, the portion of the berm where I had to tuck in, if you will, that's probably the best word, tuck in these two eight-inch howitzers, which I didn't want, plus all the artillery eight-inch ammunition stacked up. Couldn't bury it, didn't have the time to do it on the last day as they kept piling that stuff in. And so I was really concerned. One of the things that saved us, I think, was I put out an order about midnight that at two o'clock, everybody was up and we were ready. Uh, that protected some of us, not everybody. Their initial rounds took out the TOC, uh, the Tactical Operations Center for the uh, 155s. Uh, the 105s kept blasting away. The eight inches were useless. Uh, and matter of fact, they were on that side of the berm where the major assault was. The, uh, that corner where the assault really came place was uh, with the C Company people some of the new guys, unfortunately, and the, uh, that uh, platoon, the recon platoon. Um, they had an individual named uh, Peter Lemon, the Spec 4, and I'll just read you a little bit about uh, his uh, escapades there. Standing out above all others were Specialist 4 Peter Lemon, Assistant Machine Gunner to a Sergeant Vaca, and two other Spec 4s, Street and Waller. Lemon exploits. As enemy sappers began their assault, our defensive positions along the berm were returning the fire, including Vaca and Lemon. Soon the machine gun that they had jammed. Immediately Vaca threw hand grenades and Lemon began firing his M16, killing five enemy. Vaca was wounded. Lemon sees four more NVA, kills three enemy with a grenade and a fourth with his bare hands. Picks up an AK-47, firing into another group of the North Vietnamese Army people. Wounded in his side by grenade shrapnel, returns to the machine gun position, picks up the wounded Vaca, carries him to a medic, is wounded a second time, returns to the machine gun position, finds an NVA there, kills him with his bare hands, gets the machine gun to function again, continues firing until he's wounded a third time and passes out. Meanwhile, under great stress, some of the initial positions are slowly giving ground, both Waller and Street those were two other spec fours there that were performing heroically there in the line with uh, aforementioned Lemon. Uh, about this time, some of the rounds in the initial NVA bombardment ignited crates of eight inch powder canisters and had spread to the shells themselves approximately an hour after the assault began. A bunker containing about 190 rounds, these are eight inch rounds, each weighs about 200 pounds, detonated with a tremendous blast blowing a 20-foot deep crater and knocking both 8-inch howitzers out of action, not that they had been in action, out of action. Um, in a titanic roar, it turned the entire base upside down. I was quoted as saying, I thought the end of the world had come, which I did. Nearly every defender was knocked flat and many were burned and deafened. As I was quoted, I just said that through sporadic fighting continued, the explosion seemed to break the back of the attack. Um, there was intermittent firing from then on. There was still scattered hand-to-hand, uh, -hand, if you will, or close to that. But at any rate, that, that pretty much did it. So it was a plus and a minus on that artillery, that's for sure. Um, i just note that the teamwork that was displayed in the early stages of the assault, <coughs> as more of the artillery howitzers became inoperable, and artillerymen armed with their M16s joined the infantrymen at the perimeter to help fend off the attackers. As one author who has uh, written uh, recently of this uh, fire support base uh, said, artillery was key to defending Illingworth, without a doubt. Worth mentioning is the fact that over 3,300 artillery rounds were fired from the three support bases in support of Illingworth during this roughly three to four hour period. And then uh, I just uh, a note, uh, about this Captain A. Hearn by name, who was my artillery LNO and what he did. Um, all he needs is, of course, his communications. He's going to coordinate all the fires of all these other bases. He's going to keep the, uh, his own brigade, uh, the Devardi, uh, in communication and let them know how we're doing. Antennas are the first things to fall. His communication goes out. He luckily finds a PRC-25 
it's an old type FM radio uh, that most of us lived by then. And finally got contact with, of all people, um, a uh, aerial rocket artillery, excuse me, Cobra uh, attack helicopter. And this individual had the time, or he took the time to be act as the communicator and the relay between our base being hit and the other support bases. Uh, they both were magnificent. Uh, I will say, uh, when all is said and done, these courageous soldiers uh, fought against the odds and went beyond what normal American soldiers are expected to do. And I should add that uh, Spec 4 Peter Lemon was awarded the Medal of Honor by President Nixon in 1972, and the Spec 4's Waller and Street were each awarded posthumously, unfortunately, the Distinguished Service Cross. Uh, both the uh, recon platoon leader and his uh, platoon sergeant were awarded silver stars, and uh, the total of uh, Purple Hearts uh, awarded to that platoon out of 22 that I remember the count was 16 Purple Hearts awarded uh, for actions. So, at any rate, that, uh, that pretty much sums it up. It's, it's just, uh, so you have that teamwork. It uh, really goes back to that uh, demonstration that they had which saved the day, I think, for us with coordinating all those fires and leaving a room for people like that uh, helicopter to be able to come in as a medevac and to resupply as artillery uh, rounds were continu continuing to fall on the fire support base. So that was magnificent. Um, so finally, I'll just say that uh, recently my doctor warned me that considering my age, I should not continue to dwell on wine, women, and song. My advice is to give up the singing. So I will. Thanks very much for your attention. And so we come to the end. Over the last two days, you've heard incredible stories. We know war is a terrible thing, but it's not the most terrible thing. The most terrible thing is to be without hope. Ladies and gentlemen, you all bring to this nation and the world hope. Hope for a future, hope for peace, hope for family, hope just to get a meal and a bed. You stand on the precipice of what is the most meaningful thing in the world, liberty, freedom. I'll close with some words Winston Churchill said, we shall win, not through the evil in our enemies, but through the merit in ourselves. Deserve victory, and let that be the touchstone of every thought, word, and deed. This is not the end or the beginning, or the beginning of the end, or the end of the beginning. This is a touchstone in your lives. I'm 